if you're not um, doing well on stage in your act, the hook comes out and yanks you. <laughs> it's it's kind of yeah. like that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's now I'm just gonna get out and feel bad. <laughs> I'm gonna give you a warning. But as soon I, as know, I, I, I know, so, I know. So, so I know that was. I'm sorry. No, I apologize to my group. I was hitting enter into the group chat, and it just like cut me out of the group <laughs> without saying anything. There's, there's always something. So five minutes is clearly not enough time. Um, but I just wanted to give you a taste of the kinds of conversations that, you know, maybe over lunch, you have to eat sometime or tea or the water cool or whatever, um, or as part of your group meeting for maybe 10 minutes. This is actually really good to talk about. Um, I, you know, I'll just report out very quickly from my group. Um, one of the areas, and this has come up as a identity um, that, uh, person wanted to focus on as part of their Thrive Mosaic is being the mother of a young child. Nice. And that's come up quite a bit. So it's not always race or gender. It's whatever the thing is for you, you wish you could bring your full self, but it feels like you can't. So I want you to think as broadly as possible when you think about that. Um, the other thing to remember, because another part of our conversation was about um, it was an obstacle, the lack of compassion and mentorship, um, mentors not really knowing how to mentor. The beauty of the Thrive Mosaic is you, no one gets to be in your mosaic unless you invite them. Although once people kind of hear about it from someone else, they always want to ask, can I be in it? So you have to get ready to navigate that conversation. But um, you are inviting people in that you know, if their mentoring is whatever, then you talk about it and they do their homework and improve it. They, they have to also be working. It's actually a learning and growth relationship on both sides. And then there's also the fact that um, growing your uh, mosaic gives you many, many, many choices. So for mentors, for example, um, oh, I lost count. I think I have about 80. So I have some that is just around, how do you develop a kick butt data management plan? Others are around, how do you talk to your program officer for your NSF? And then I have two people that all they look at is the entire arc of my career and you know, given what goals I have. So the more you can segment it down to what you want as far as mentoring from a person, the better off you are. Because, and also you can have many people who could mentor you on that same little piece so that you can hear from different perspectives um, when you need to kind of get a second opinion, so to speak. <laughs> you can do that. So it, it really gives you mobility and options and access that you normally would not have in the kinds of relationships the Academy has designed as far as they call everything mentoring for the most part. So as far as mentoring. So, and the same for connectors, you should have as many connectors as you can. Now I will say, I'm gonna add a series of slides to the deck I'm gonna send you because depending on what stage of your career you're at, um, there are certain roles that you wanna start populating more. And so this way you can think about that as well. If you're in senior leadership, if you're assistant, if you're tenured, if you're full, if you're a postdoc, here are the, the roles you should be, you should be looking and talking to people about and assessing whether or not they would be appropriate for your mosaic. One of the, I think it's a book chapter uh, that I'll send as a PDF, actually talks about how to populate it, how to sit down and have a conversation and things like that. So that might be helpful. Um, Thank you. Um, um, oh, yes, go ahead. Oh, no, no, I said thank you. Oh, you're welcome. So make sure you just dump everything on Keith. And also, he is also capturing or recording this session. But um, I wanted to go ahead and move on to the second part. Here it is. To the second part of this program, which is a little shorter, but I think it's important. So we talked about 
just a nice graphic so you have it. Uh, we talked about, um, okay, so we talked about the sort of sum of individuals. So this next section speaks around one tiny aspect of the sum of institutional um, work. And so uh, I picked as a topic um, or was requested that I use this particular topic on um, some work that I've done at a number of institutions, including Wellesley and MIT, but also I do consulting. So uh, I worked with a number of different kinds of institutions around institutional activism, because this whole thing, um, the whole point of our talk today is action for change. So activism, um, so action, what are things that we can begin thinking about? What are some new paradigms we can begin sort of exploring, that kind of thing. And so anyway, I'm gonna focus on tenure and merit reviews and just give you a slice of some of the work um, uh, that was done at Wellesley College that they are still, I'm very close to my former colleagues there. And before COVID, we used to do a lot of dinners and things like that. So, um, so this is what they are currently um, doing in their tenure and merit reviews. So the, Challenge for them was that uh, in, I think it was like 18 years or something crazy like that, they had had underrepresented faculty, you know, come in as assistant professor and all, um, but none had um, achieved tenure. So they all end up leaving. So it's like a revolving door. And it was actually making it very difficult for them to get uh, underrepresented talent to even consider coming there because they're like, well, nobody's been tenured. Now they did have uh, two, two senior faculty um, in, well, three actually, uh, across two departments that 20 years earlier, they had brought in as tenured already. They had brought in senior faculty and they were, in fact, they're all, I think only one is left that's gonna be retiring soon. So. So that was a big issue. And I um, was responsible for working with the faculty dean, uh, faculty affairs. And so I would attend the tenure and promotion committee meetings for a number of reasons. One is to do some um, leadership development, leadership, but it's training, but leadership development for the committee to find out what the committee felt it did well already so that we could build on that and what frustrated them. So they were frustrated because it seemed like no matter what they did, they kept getting the same result year after year. No tenure, no one gets tenure uh, from their underrepresented scholars. So um, let's talk about the basis of tenure just to start with. Um, often it's based on your research slash teaching slash depending on the kind of institution, um, if this was liberal arts, teaching would come before research, but both are important. You know, they're, they're, they vary. So you know for your institution, institutions, what appears to be the things that if you don't do, no matter how great you do everything else, it's not gonna work. That's kind of how you determine. Um, student evaluations of teaching, uh, they are really important in a liberal arts uh, environment because teaching and the ability to, to innovate around pedagogy, et cetera, is, is important. Um, uh, the invisible labor of underrepresented scholars is something that was not, um, not even noticed uh, and certainly not rewarded. Um, and then there was a practice of excusing white faculty um, from having to do service of connecting with underrepresented students and, you know, mentoring them and, you know, doing things with them, nominating them, taking them to conferences, that kind of thing was just simply not happening for the most part. And then also another one that's kind of interesting, I don't know, you might want to do this kind of analysis for your own institution, is uh, the in inequitable service assignment. So, when you are assigned to serve on a committee as a member or a chair, um, you know, there's a, usually um, there's a committee, actually it's our, um, God, I forgot what they called it, but anyway, they have a committee that looks at this 
Oh, the agenda committee that sets the agenda for faculty senate. You know, they also assign faculty to committees. And you know, faculty get to say, this is my first choice, second, whatever. Um, and I looked at roles like who, who gets to be the assistant dean, who gets to be directors of programs, et cetera, uh, and, and department chairs, that kind of thing. Um, and I did an analysis looking back over 10 years and found that for folks that ended up either being the provost or being one of the deans or one of these kind of roles, they served on, they all served on particular committees and in some cases chaired a specific or particular committee. Now, I, you know, I put this all together and, you know, reported it out and everyone was shocked because they didn't even realize that this pattern, this is where culture each strategy for breakfast, right? So, you, you know, they didn't even realize this is the sum of individual behaviors that ended up with an unintended outcome. Um, and for underrepresented scholars in particular, they would um, be assigned, tend to be assigned to um, other committees other than these, or maybe only have one of the three that every academic dean ends up, you know, ends up having in their portfolio, so to speak. Um, and they also were asked to serve on um, committees related to, um, you know, under, uh, underrepresented affairs or, you know, whatever, that kind of thing. Recruitment and retention. I hate the word retention, but there it is again, uh, that kind. And so that's fine, but those, that service is valued in a different way, even though nobody will say it or may not even realize it. It is, it is sort of discounted in a way. And so um, as much as possible for each of these things, um, you should, when I say you, uh, whoever's responsible, um, and that would be leadership in the organization, should actually go back and look at the trends across uh, things like uh, inequitable service assignments. So I'm gonna point out two things in particular. Um, over the next couple of minutes. And that is student evaluations of teaching, SEQs, which they vary in their importance across institutions. We had them when I was at MIT, but you're, it's not gonna keep you from getting tenure if your research profile is what they expect. Um, at a, a liberal arts college, um, it will, it will keep you from getting tenure if you get consistently um, poor evaluation, student evaluations. Um, and let me write this down so I won't forget, bias and SEQs. I will send, um, attach an article as well that just talks about the bias and student evaluations and whether they are anonymous or not, what the difference is in the reporting. But just to give you an example, one area of bias, uh, well, one area in particular has to do with um, whether students perceive you have an accent, meaning different from what they're used to hearing. And so it turns out the research shows it doesn't matter if your accent is barely detectable, but you know something's, you know, not, or is um, strong enough that people really have to have a difficult time understanding you, it would um, end up reflecting poorly in equal amounts on the student evaluations, with the exception of one accent. If you have a British accent, it was a plus. But every other accent, no matter how light or how heavy, it was a negative and, you know, w without much of a point spread either. I mean, just almost the same score. And so that's an area of bias, right? Another one is around um, ethnicity. And it's really what students expect uh, their, uh, as far as stereotypes assigned to different ethnicities and genders. How women faculty are supposed to be in the classroom versus men faculty. Well, women or faculty of other genders other than male, cis male. Um, so, you know, these things are important. So these are the kinds of discussions and readings um, that happen within the tenure and promotion committee. 
The second thing that the committee did, and this is over like a three year period, uh, is they said, well, wait, this whole invisible service are not giving credit for, you know, uh, our URM scholars who are overwhelmed with that work and still have to get their research and teaching and all done. You know, we should count that. We should have all faculty report how they're contributing to the educational, optimal educational experience of a diverse community of students. And so, you know, there's a process, you gotta get it through faculty governors. Anyway, but long story short, there's a, now an additional form um, that faculty uh, have to fill out when they talk about their activities, research, et cetera, outside activities. That's another one. And so they actually count that now towards your tenure because you need faculty who can engage across many different kinds of um, students and perspectives. And it's a became a huge signal to faculty who normally could be excused from doing that. Um, they realized they had to start doing something because this was, you know, for their merit review, they might not get the increase they were hoping for because they didn't have any, they didn't have anything to offer as far as service. So that became a very important part of service towards tenure, towards merit review, um, et cetera. And so uh, the first year that went through, um, I became very busy at Wellesley because uh, a lot of faculty were like, oh, okay, so what, what should I do? What can I do? So we put together some programming to help them come up with ideas for what they can do and then help them execute that. But that is now part of their tenure and merit review process. And there are a number of other things that they did as well. Um, but that one in particular is the one I'm most proud of them because that particular one, they made it clear we are an academic community that values all perspectives and we support and the learning curricular and co-curricula of all of our students and in, you know, all of our colleagues, et cetera, um, regardless of background or ethnicity or gender or whatever. And we give service to the institution to help elevate um, the institution in that area. Just like we do by elevating the research and elevating the teaching, depends on the institution, what they you know think as their shining example of what something is worth but now that took some you know besides working with the committee um the provost is on that committee which was good uh you know that had to go through you know the president the board of trustees i mean it it, it had to go through the faculty you know it, it took about three years altogether to get all the changes into place because it was five or six different things that they did but um, at that point, they had, I think, seven or eight um, assistant professors uh, of color, underrepresented, and I think five were going to be coming up in the next year or two. And they are always nervous when the, these scholars are coming up because they haven't been tenuring anybody. But when they were able to really um, evaluate, understand bias and evaluations, understand bias in, in the internal and external letters, understand how to work with department level RMP committee that puts forward the case to the tenure and promotions committee. Um, just, there were a lot of things that had to be attended to, but once they did, um, you know, people, people earn tenure. <laughs> and so, I know they have at least eight or nine tenured faculty of color right now. They, it's a small faculty, so they only hire so many every year um, in general, but I have to tell you. And then also we had to do work on the side of outreach recruitment, et cetera. That's a different, different talk for a different day. But, um, and there is a framework for how um, that I developed over the years for how to do that um, so that you don't get stuck thinking, but there aren't any fill in the blank, whatever the, you know, women, whatever, because of course there are, but it's almost like having blinders on and until you remove them and learn, you know, how to see, you just won't know that they're there. 
Um, so I will um, include some extra slides around some of these. Um, I will also um, include the cultural continuum um, tool, which we won't be talking about today, but I'll, I'll have a, um, a worksheet for that and an example or two. Uh, and it's a way for you to evaluate within your department or within your you know, curriculum committee or whatever, um, where you are, not as a whole committee, but for each of the functions of your committee, because some will be higher on the continuum than others. I also tell people, um, look at PJ Henry's article on institutional bias, which I'll send. Anytime you see differential outcomes, basically, for something that is supposed to be um, an objective process, that tells you something is happening. There is, um, there's something happening. Won't even say what it is, but something is keeping that from being a normal distribution. And so whatever is skewing it, at least you know now, there, you just need to look closer and um, see, you know, what might possibly be going on. So, whoops, let me click on this. And so um, this graphic, I'm not gonna go through it, but basically I actually um, talked about some of the things in the previous slide, but I did it also as just a visual because it's a little easier to take in. Um, we're not gonna do a breakout group for that only because we started late, but um, I do want to um, make sure we have time for Q and A. And so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Good. And um, you know, any questions or comments or ideas um, uh, or feedback that you have, I would love to, um, to talk with you now. All right, thank you, Keith. Yeah, and so if you have a question, you can put it in the chat box, although it would also work well if you just would unmute your microphone and um, pipe right in. Okay, I, I put this in the chat box. Um, you uh, discussed the form that Wellesley developed for evaluating, mm -hmm. reporting and evaluating service. Yep. Is it possible to get copies of that? Yeah, and I'm uh, just uh, typing it in. Um, I can send a version of the form. Uh, I actually spoke to uh, the, the faculty dean there, and they weren't keen on, you know, <laughs> giving out their stuff. But um, I can send you basically what the questions are for the most part. Great. Yeah, I think that would be very helpful. Very helpful. And, uh, and that's just one thing within a tenure and merit review committee to think about. And so you know, just looking at where there are differential outcomes, let's say in that committee. So for example, we've noticed that women take longer before coming up than men or less women come up for full than whatever, whatever it is. If you see a differential outcome, it's worth slowing down and just taking a look and see what are either obstacles or, you know, what, what, what are we not examining that maybe we should be examining and including. Um, that kind of, these kinds of conversations. It's different in every institution, so there's no cookie cutter fit for it, but, you know, that's a good start. Let me see. Okay, and maybe I'm time for just one more question if we have it. <laughs> okay. I think well, we have some things in the chat oh, coming through. Yeah, I see. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, yeah, you can you can definitely uh, come up with a lot of examples for that. So um, here's one that has nothing to do with academia. Okay, so let's say um, uh, finally they did some new paving of the sidewalk. And, um, you know, so you walk to the corner, you turn, and then you walk as opposed to what people were used to doing, 
which was just cutting across the grass. So they wanted to keep people from cutting across the grass. So let's just give them a nice walkway and they'll do it. That's a good, that's a good idea. That's kind of a strategy. Um, but what happens is people still keep cutting across the grass. And so, uh, and I've seen this, which is really interesting. I remember at MIT, I just remember I was a student then, but I just remember, wow, that, that really is true. They finally gave up the institution and just built a, a concrete, a, a path across the grass as well, because people are gonna do it. Um, so Peter Drucker um, uh, was one of the first people to talk about that. Uh, and so all that means is that as you're thinking of things you're gonna do or ideas you wanna try, um, great is the strategy or, or something you wanna pilot, but also think, hey, what's the culture here around the thing we're trying to address? You have to acknowledge and try to identify as much of what people are just doing as a sum of individual behaviors and sometimes as a, a sum of institutional um, policies and practices, like you just, you have to, you have to, you, they can't remain tacit as you think through strategy. You have to consider them um, because your strategy has to be aligned um, with the culture in some way um, so that they can enable each other to bring about real change. So, um, look that up, look up uh, Peter Drucker as well, and that, that was one of his sayings, but when you think of transformational change of a culture of an organization or an institution, it's really important. Okay, well, Dr. Chapman, uh, thank you very much. Um, we look forward to receiving those materials from you. And just a quick note that we're really trying to build continuity within the Alliance that for the current fellows and new incoming group at um, Charlotte. Um, our first meetings or meeting of the fall will be building upon um, Robin's presentation. Um, and so we're looking forward to digging deeper into some of the things yes. that's in today. Yes, and I really appreciate um, the work that you've all done and that you continue doing. Um, it's gonna be, you know, so far 2020 has been a little iffy so here's our opportunity to really make lemonade out of lemons and just sort of, you know, make progress on some of the things that we normally don't have time to focus on because we're going about our every day. That's been disrupted, so it's an opportunity to refocus. And I, I know I'm taking advantage of it as much as I can, and I hope you will. Well, enjoy the rest of your summit. I looked at the, the uh, agenda, and it just looks really exciting. So. Um, I'll get out of your hair and thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Okay, great. Thank you again. And I uh, have up here the schedule for everyone. Majority of people will be staying here.